This video is an introduction into cellular respiration. This is part one of two videos. This video specifically focuses on what is cellular respiration globally, anaerobic respiration, and glycolysis. So let's look into cellular respiration. Before I get to the specifics, I want you to keep in mind what is the whole point of cellular respiration? It's to make ATP, adenosine triphosphate. We're going to go through a lot of complicated chemical steps, and my hope is you don't lose the forest for the trees. The purpose for all of this is just to make ATP to power the chemical reactions that occur inside of cells. To do this, living things are going to have to extract or harvest the energy stored in organic molecules. Most commonly, the energy that can be found in the bonds forming carbohydrates, fats, lipids, and proteins. If you are a heterotroph, an organism such as a human, you obtain these biomolecules by eating other molecules through the food that you eat, whether it's an animal or a plant. In the case of autotrophs, however, things like plants, they don't eat to get their organic molecules. Instead, they create the organic molecules that are broken down by cellular respiration through photosynthesis. Glucose is going to be the model that we're going to analyze when looking at how living things are able to produce ATP. And this is a catabolism of the glucose molecule, meaning we're going to be breaking that molecule down. Here is the overall chemical reaction for cellular respiration. Glucose and oxygen in, out comes ATP energy, water, and carbon dioxide. Here are the molecular formulas for each. And this is something you've experienced your whole life. You take in nutrients, glucose being one of them, you're breathing in oxygen all the time, out comes water as waste, CO2 you breathe out, and ATP remains as being used for energy in your cells. You of course also give off heat all of the time as an effect of this reaction. I want you to think about combustion. Combustion is a step where you're making a lot of heat energy by burning a lot of fuel in one quick rapid step. You light the match, the fire begins. Oxygen feeds that combustion. It is no coincidence that a fire cannot occur in oxy without oxygen, so too can you not do cellular respiration without oxygen. The big difference here is with respiration, instead of having one big chemical reaction, we're going to burn a fuel in many, many small steps. Think back to when we learned about enzymes and looked at metabolic pathways. By having several enzymes and making one small reaction after another, cells are able to reduce the activation energy required to do a reaction. With cellular respiration, living things are going to be doing just that. Many, many small enzymatic steps to slowly burn the fuel obtained from glucose. This is the most efficient and the most effective because if a cell were to break glucose open immediately, that would release so much much heat that it would cook the cell. So how are we going to do this harvesting? Well, we're going to have to digest large molecules into small ones. We're going to have to break bonds and move electrons around. To be a little more specific, let's look at the reaction down here. In some instances, an electron is going to have to be transferred or lost, and in other instances, an electron is going to be gained. A reminder of your time in chemistry, there are terms for each. When an atom loses an electron, that's referred to as an oxidation. When it gains an electron, that's referred to as being a reduction. You may remember the little phrase, Leo goes Ger. Leo, lose electrons oxidized. Ger, gain electrons reduced. So keep this in mind as we learn cellular respiration, because cellular respiration is a redox reaction, meaning if there's an oxidation, something loses electrons, and a reduction, something gains electrons. To move electrons in living systems, the hydrogen atom is the primary vehicle for doing this. Looking at the hydrogen atom, the hydrogen atom has one electron and one proton. This makes it ideal for ripping off an electron or having a free-floating proton, an H plus ion, which can be used to power some reactions. So when we're looking at this redox reaction, we're always focused on those electrons, how things are moving. In the case of cellular respiration, the glucose molecule we can see is broken down into CO2. It's lost electrons, so we say that glucose is oxidized, whereas the oxygen is gaining electrons when it becomes water, so we say that oxygen has been reduced. And it's the hydrogens that are making this happen. These redox reactions in respiration We'll continue that process forward. So just as a summary of these new terms with an oxidation, it could be something such as adding an oxygen, a reduction we're removing. 
For an oxidation, we could be removing a hydrogen. Again, oxidation is losing electrons. With reduction, we'd be adding one, gaining an electron. Well, oxidation, loss of electrons, reduction, gain of electrons. We have a release of energy when we're losing those electrons during an oxidation, and we're storing energy when we're forming bonds with a reduction. That's why we say oxidations are exergonic and reductions are endergonic. The primary molecule that's going to cause most electron transfers to occur in the case of cellular respiration is a molecule known as NAD plus or NADH. This is an electron carrier. It's a molecule that moves electrons around by shuttling hydrogens from one place to another. When it's an NAD plus, it can pick up a hydrogen and become an NADH, and we'd say it's reduced because it's gained an electron. Another molecule that does this is FAD, same idea. FAD plus two is able to gain two hydrogens, so it's reduced. To transfer hydrogens around, these molecules are recycled and reused in cells. So these two, NAD and FAD, will go pick up hydrogens and then later on can go and deposit those hydrogens off and be reused in their oxidized or plus form. So as these are transferred around, as I tell you a little bit about cellular respiration, I want you to think of these electron carriers as putting money in the bank. NADH and FADH are like molecular piggy banks. Each of them are able to carry in a hydrogen with an electron. Carrying that electron around is a resource cells can use later on to make ATP. ATP is the focus of cellular respiration. So there's two main ways that respiration occurs in living systems. They can occur with something we call anaerobic respiration or aerobic respiration. Anaerobic respiration is converting glucose into ATP without the use of oxygen. Aerobic respiration is converting glucose to ATP with the use of oxygen. When you think about ourselves, what kind of respiration do you think we do? Well, we actually do both. Normally we do aerobic respiration. Oxygen has a bigger ATP payoff when it's used for cellular respiration, but if you're working out heavily and you need a little extra ATP to get it through, your body can then transition to also doing anaerobic, which doesn't require the oxygen your body is deficit in when pushing your body to its physical limits. Here are some more specifics on these two processes. For anaerobic respiration, respiration without oxygen, this reaction occurs in the cytosol or the cytoplasm of a cell, and it's made up of two primary processes, something called glycolysis and some kind of fermentation, either alcoholic or lactic acid. For aerobic respiration though, respiration with oxygen, this occurs in both the cytosol and the mitochondria. Glycolysis still occurs out in the cytosol, but after that step, we have many more things, such as the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, which occur within the folds of the mitochondria. So if I were to give you a big overview of all of cellular respiration, if we're doing aerobic respiration, it has four primary stages. The first is glycolysis. All living things do glycolysis in the cytosol. After that, if we're doing aerobic respiration, there's pyruvate oxidation, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. For this lecture, we're gonna focus just on glycolysis, the first stage of both aerobic and anaerobic respiration. The whole goal of glycolysis is to break down sugar. If you look at the word itself, glyco means sugar, lysis means to split. So this is the first split of that glucose molecule when trying to extract energy from it. Overall, what we're gonna be doing is breaking the six carbon glucose down into two, three carbon molecules called pyruvate. This is a very, very ancient pathway, evolutionarily speaking. Oh, the oldest life forms we've discovered do glycolysis. It is very effective in breaking down glucose, but it's inefficient. It only generates two ATP for one glucose molecule. Two ATP is nowhere near enough for anything as small as you moving one of your muscles. Why does it make sense from an evolutionary perspective to have all of metabolism begin in the cytosol? Well, think about prokaryotes. Prokaryotes, they have cytosol, ribosomes, and free-floating DNA. Eukaryotes have cytosol as well. If we're gonna go all the way back to an ancestral cell, we need a process that works in cells that don't have organelles like the mitochondria, such as bacteria, and glycolysis fits that need. 
So from an evolutionary perspective, again, thinking of those first prokaryotes, life on Earth started without oxygen. So it makes sense that glycolysis, our first process, has evolved for occurring without oxygen, and it's persisted since then in all the living things that have evolved since. So before I give you the grand overview of glycolysis, I'm going to play a video that I think does a really good job of explaining it. How do you turn that bite of food into a chemical that a cell can recognize and use as energy? The first step is altering the food into its component chemical compounds and then getting those molecules into your cells. That process is called digestion. Once inside your cells, the process of turning that bite of food into useful energy by cellular respiration begins. The process of digestion results with carbohydrates and other molecules being removed from the consumed food and transported into the bloodstream. From there, nutrients, like the carbohydrate glucose, will leave the bloodstream through a capillary wall and enter a tissue cell. Once inside the cell, cellular respiration will completely oxidize the glucose molecule. A reminder, oxidation is the loss of electrons. So now that glucose has entered the, entered the cell, our goal is to break it down to shed as many electrons off as we can. Why? Those electrons can be carried by electron carriers, our piggy banks, NADH and FADH, and used later on to make ATP. So let's now look at the first split, glycolysis. Releasing high energy electrons. The overall goal is to make ATP, a storage form of energy for most cells. Cellular respiration is a four-stage process that begins with glycolysis. Glycolysis literally means splitting sugars, and it is the first step of cellular respiration, occurring in the cytoplasm of the cell. Glycolysis consists of two distinct phases, an energy investment phase and an energy harvesting phase. In the energy investment phase, two ATP molecules transfer energy to the glucose molecule. Notice the yellow spheres that have been added. Those are phosphates from ATP. Two ATPs come up, each donate a phosphate, and two ADPs, adenosine diphosphate, leave. This helps destabilize the sugar. Forming a six carbon sugar diphosphate molecule. This molecule splits, and the energy harvesting phase begins. During this phase, the two three carbon molecules are converted to pyruvate, and ATP is formed. Glycolysis is a 10-step reaction that involves the activity of multiple enzymes and enzyme assistance. In the process, a net of two molecules of ATP, two molecules of pyruvate, and two high-energy electron-carrying molecules of NADH are produced. So let's look at this again in some more detail now that you've seen an overview of how glycolysis occurs. So here you can see a diagram of those two steps, the energy requiring or investing steps and the energy releasing steps. So our first step, we have glucose, and glucose is broken down into two molecules known as P-gal, sometimes they're also referred to as fructose disphosphate, depends on the phase the molecule is in, and two ATPs had to be spent in the process. So we've already lost two ATP. That sucks, the whole goal here is to make ATP and now I'm in debt by negative two. There's a reason for this. By adding those phosphates, we destabilize the sugar and can move on to the energy releasing steps. In the energy releasing steps, we get a big payoff for our investment. Those two P-gal are converted into two pyruvic acid, which can be used later to get even more energy from. We gain two NADHs, money in the bank, remember electron carriers are piggy banks, and we get a total of four ATP generated, two from each P-gal. So we've gained plus four ATP and two NADH, score. Totaling this together, we gained four ATP, but we spent two, so we have a net gain of two ATP and a net gain of two NADH. Great, we've made a little energy and harvested that from sugar. This again is just showing you a summary of that process. First step's endergonic, we're breaking things down, we're spending a little energy. The reason for that is we get a big exergonic payoff. We're able to harvest even more ATP and a little bit of NADH, some money in the bank to use later on in other steps.
So that's not a lot of energy. That's enough energy to sustain something as small as a prokaryotic cell, but not as anything as sophisticated as, say, a sponge, one of the simplest animals on the planet. This explains why bacteria have remained relatively simple. It isn't until the development of oxygen later on in Earth's history that we're able to generate more ATP than this and get more complicated living organisms. But the process doesn't stop here. When glycolysis occurs, it actually creates a problem. So now we have 2 pyruvate, 2 ATP, and 2 NADH. Let's say I'm a bacteria and I want to do glycolysis again. I want to make another 2 ATP. Well, I can't. I no longer have 2 NAD+. I need those 2 NAD+, to grab hydrogens and go through the process of glycolysis. But I'm stuck with 2 NADH instead. This is a problem. The bacteria or yourself going through anaerobic respiration is going to run out of NAD pluses and be stuck with NADHs. What can we do to get rid of these NADHs so that we can get NAD pluses and make more glycolysis? Well, there's two solutions life has evolved so far. Both are a form of what we call fermentation. One is called lactic acid fermentation, the other alcoholic. Here's how it works. For creatures like mammals, ourselves, and some bacteria, what will happen after glycolysis to get rid of the hydrogen on those NADHs, a lactic acid dehydrogenase will come in, rip those hydrogens off to regenerate NAD plus and form a waste product called lactate, also known as lactic acid. By doing this, we now have two NAD pluses that can go back into glycolysis and we can repeat the process again to make ATP. Again, fermentation's whole point is just to regenerate NAD pluses to lose that hydrogen. And you've all felt lactic acid. If you worked out and had sore muscles afterwards, that's lactic acid. Also, if you've ever eaten yogurt, what gives yogurt its unique flavor is the lactic acid that's produced by anaerobic bacteria that break down milk to make it. What most bacteria and yeast, a fungus, do for fermentation instead is something called alcoholic fermentation. It's the same idea as lactic acid. We're going to go through a chemical reaction to get rid of those hydrogens, and this time, instead of making lactic acid, ethanol and alcohol is produced as a waste product. So pyruvate is the key branching point on what happens next. If there's no oxygen available to the cell, the cell will take that pyruvate and undergo fermentation, either lactic acid or alcoholic. But if we have a eukaryote, something with the mitochondria and oxygen is present, the cell can then use the leftover pyruvate and make work of it. We can go through the steps of the Krebs cycle and electron transport chain and aerobic respiration. And instead of making only the two ATP that we made here, we can actually make upwards to 40 ATP total using oxygen and some further chemical steps. So in this lecture, I've just introduced you to the first step, glycolysis. It happens in both anaerobic and aerobic organisms. It gets you a net gain of two ATP from one sugar molecule. You end up with the byproduct of pyruvate, which can be used later on in aerobic respiration. But if you aren't able to do aerobic, you're doing anaerobic instead, you'll go through fermentation to regenerate the NAD plus and pyruvate will just be a waste product that's probably converted into either ethanol or lactic acid. I hope this was a helpful introduction to cellular respiration, and in the next video, I will go through aerobic in more detail and teach you how pyruvic acid can be converted through multiple steps to generate even more ATP to support something as complex as yourself. Thank you.